Remember this? Now, you're probably wondering, where's the car? And that's kind of what we're here to talk about. This build series did not go exactly according to plan. Well, it did. It was a 10% Cayenne. That then became a 90% Cayenne and so it up. Welcome to episode four. So Mike, we're about to go on an emotional roller coaster. Uh, coming off of North Carolina, boom, Bam. car was there. Yeah, was it feeling, was at 80%. I was time. feeling really good. We did get to take it on some trails. For like 10 minutes. Yeah, it was pretty quick. Ethan was literally running around the car, yeah. getting as much as he could. I think Ethan put more miles on his sneakers than we did. That's on the, super fair. <laughs> and in the other year, I was tried a shot. So we're coming back from North Carolina. We have an 80% Cayenne. Today, we need to explain why it became quite literally Today, a 0% Cayenne. Today, you need to explain. Did I say we again? You need to explain. All right, I need to come clean. Time was on our side. All we had left was we were adding our Baja Designs lights. We were doing our Thule, a rooftop tent, our Thule awning. Mm -hmm. We wanted to do a few accessories just throughout the car, and then we had our fun build out, cabin tree in the rear. But we had time for all those things. So we were honestly chipping away pretty slowly, admittedly, yeah. until we got a phone call. It was our brand director, Michael Herzen, who had the great idea, basically three days before, a massive event in Colorado that we should be sending the Cayenne across the country for Grid Life Alpine Horizons. Our boy Essa was there, so he was actually going to set up for the weekend, and we were like, hey, what's the perfect support vehicle? Literally why we made this vehicle yeah. was to go to things like this. So with those three days notice, we did what we could in that amount of time, and Michael himself helped us on the car, yes, I will did. say that. So the late hours of the night. Yeah, kind of putting some finishing touches, Michael, what are you doing? Put a lipstick on a pig. Not to mention we had a, a magazine photo shoot to get done before Colorado. Yeah, that's right. But look, our new sights were set from taking our time to let's make it happen. Let's freaking go. I was super excited for it. And then there was that bonus that Ethan, remember our camera guy, buddy, and coworker, would have a great opportunity to shoot the Cayenne, take our time, spend a full day in the mountains, really do it justice for all the work we had to put into it. But there's no way you were gonna go off-roading by yourself in Colorado in a brand new rig. I'm basically as rookie as it comes <laughs> with that stuff. I do not know the area, I don't know the capabilities, I don't know what to expect. So I put that in the hands of our friends at Berg, who were up the road in Denver, who also have three badass Cayennes. They have two 955s, a 957. So we had a little posse of Cayennes that were gonna head into the wilderness and get some cool content. So other than me not being there, how did the trails compare in Colorado versus North Carolina? The trails honestly weren't that difficult in the beginning. Cars were being challenged, we were being challenged as drivers a little bit, but nothing that I wasn't confident in tackling. That said, I knew based on the signs that we saw, things were gonna get hairy. Pretty much every time we came across someone on the trail, they had something to say to us. We just saw an ATVer who basically laughed and asked us if we knew where we were headed. He just said he was gonna turn around to watch us all smash our bumpers in the sides of our cars. So. This may be the last time we see the car here. This may be the last time we see the car here. Last time we see the car here. A little bit worried, I'm not gonna lie. That dude was like, definitely telling us we're screwed. So I guess we'll see how this goes. the way and showed us how to tackle the first feature. Germany!
Once it was my turn to go, I may have gotten a little bit overzealous because I was enjoying the smoke that my retires were making. That said, I was able to climb this obstacle without too much difficulty. Dude, what the frick? That was sick. I'm shaking. How was that? That was exhilarating. That was, that was, it. look at it, look back. Look, just look at it. That was insane. It wasn't the easiest thing, but the rig, the Cayenne, totally capable. My driving abilities, questionable. Questionable, but still got up where we needed to get it up. It was pretty evident that what we had gone up against so far wasn't the extent of what we were about to see. I think after we lost the first Cayenne after snapping an axle, that was like a little bit of reality that hit. But seeing one of those cars go down and then realizing, okay, like we're gonna probably have to drag this out. How far were you guys in on the trailer? We were a few miles in at that point. Okay. With one Cayenne left behind, we continued on the trail up the mountain towards the next peak. Smooth and steady. With each obstacle getting more and more difficult, my confidence in the Cayenne actually began to grow. Overconfidence, however, isn't always a good thing. Order throttle, you know. <laughs> there we go, right there. Come on, baby. Hit it. There we go. Mama's got a new pair of shoes. It wasn't until uh, maybe two or three features where Cole got stuck climbing up a really thin single track section to actually where we were planning to kind of stop because we saw it in the distance. It was like this really nice flat parking spot. He got stuck like right before that. It was funny. It wasn't a big deal. Like, you know, car wasn't in a, in a bad situation. Kyan actually towed it out. Okay. You know, first time Check. we got to be a tow vehicle. <laughs> So you got the shots, you had two or three features that were pretty cool. One Cayenne down, one Cayenne stuck. Why didn't you stop there? I mean, when you put it like that, it made a lot of sense just to stop. My adrenaline was pretty freaking cranked. But yet again, friendly local stopped by in his truck. It was like three kids, two dogs hanging out the back, a wife that was giddy. He said that we would be stupid not to keep going. And we said, why? He said, because there's a water feature that you absolutely have to see. I was like, this is gonna be casual. Like this is, actually isn't gonna be bad. So we honestly went back and forth a bit uh, because it was already starting to get kind of late for what Ethan and I were comfortable with in terms of time. We And this is right before going home. We were supposed to fly back the next morning. Yeah, and honestly, no cell reception. Like you are super deep. So there was a lot of stuff left to do. So all signs were pointing, stop, turn, turn around. around. You got the shots. We even you had space, we even had space to turn around where we were. When you look over and it's just a sheer cliff with a couple hundred feet drop, it's scary. And it, uh, it was honestly pretty hairy getting down there. Like admittedly, I've never seen Ethan scared or stop shooting. His camera was between Sorry. his legs. His eye, he was literally, would not look at me. Because if Ethan had to stop shooting, I think I would have probably been like, let's turn around. So you're at the bottom of this river crossing. You've ignored all the signs. But there were technically no actual physical signs, which I actually wish that there were. Either telling me not to do it, telling me how to do it properly. So, and I'm not blaming that. I'm just saying I wish there was something physically there to tell me. I mean, I replay this whole scenario back in my head, I don't know, probably a million times since this has happened. First kind went through, Aaron took their car through, and it was so eerie because he was going at a speed where it looked like the car was honestly starting to drift down the river. I, I, I got so nervous, but anyway. I can't even explain this because it is like giving me anxiety. What felt like three hours, I think, was like a 30 second decision. And so, yeah, I. I you did it. I did it. Go! Having already felt an engine hydro lock on my focus, I knew pretty quickly what situation I was in. Don't, don't turn it off. Don't, don't turn it off. Yeah, don't turn it off. Just keep going. And everybody go. was kind of yelling at me, like, keep going. I was yeah. like, I'd keep, I was going, yelling, if keep I, going. If I could keep going, I'd keep going. So in that scene where you literally stop in the middle of the river, it's still running. What it's, kept you from just like... It's, it's not still running, so that it looks like it's running. Because the exhaust but is burbling. But the exhaust is burbling, and it's literally just the, the exhaust taking on water and burping it out, essentially. It turned off. It's hydro lock. Swinch it. Did it stop? Did it stop? 
Hell yeah. I subconsciously felt like that was gonna happen, and then when it happened, it was like, of course this happened. Yo, Ben, what's going on, bro? I hate my life. You just blew up your mini motor. This one's way more expensive. Told you you'd turn around up there. Yeah. I wanted to. I wasn't even worried about the fact that I had just hydrolocked an engine. I was more so concerned with what that meant for repercussions for everything else. I started thinking about the fact that we didn't have cell phone reception. I thought about the fact that our team didn't know where we were. I thought about the liability of the whole thing. I thought about how dumb I looked and, had, and you know, there's all these scenarios where like, I didn't care about the car. I literally, right off in my head. You can almost see it in my eyes where I'm just like kind of glazed over because my head kind of goes to the extreme reality of like we're not getting this out and not even in like a oh poor me look what I did kind of what was just like and the people around me were completely opposite They're, these are off-road people so like even the jeep guys were coming over and lending a hand and they just wanted to fix it in the moment they were ready to go and even, they were the optimistic ones oh, there for the lack of me yeah they want they wanted to pull the car apart they want to start looking at it. and in my head I was like I felt what happened I know this thing has probably a bent rod if nothing else, like the amount of water I was sitting in, and I knew the electrical systems were underneath my feet, I just knew that like... There was no way out. Yeah, even if we got this thing to limp, like to get it out because of what we just came through, it's not like we just needed to drive it down the street or get it to the shop. It was like, this car needed to be 100% to drive out of here. <laughs> and there was no chance of it getting there. Remember, we had already broken one kind that needed to get dragged out, so that was still sitting three miles deep into the oh, trails. God. And just the fact that we had an FCPO branded vehicle literally sitting in the forest, in the unmanned nowhere, in the middle of nowhere with a bunch of parts and stickers. Not a good feeling. Of course it starts downpouring on us. Why, it was a beautiful day all day. Literally standing there starting to work and it starts downpouring. Oh, while well, trying to make a flight back in less yeah, than Yeah, and you can see hours. in Ethan's eyes, like, I just felt guilty. I felt so guilty for what I put him through, what I was putting the, the Berg people through. And it was, and then I started thinking, like, all for what? You know what I mean? Uh, yes, we were excited to make this series. Yes, we wanted to go to Colorado, we wanted to do all this stuff, but it was just, like, super frustrating. Uh, super disappointed in myself. Like this was a mis mistake I personally, you know, take ownership of. Like this was, this was me. This was Ben making this mistake, putting us, the company, the car, me in that situation, and like that weighs heavily on my conscience. Like I'm a human, I have an ethical code. Because this weighed so heavily on my conscience, like I went back and actually reached out to the the people who actually maintain these trails, specific trails. And the reality is, like this isn't constant battle for the offer community. Is one, people knowing their own personal abilities, knowing their rigs' abilities, and then honestly knowing what they can and can't do or should or shouldn't try or how to do it properly. So now I know how I should have approached the river. I know that I would have wanted to measure how deep it was. I should have checked my intake situation. I, all these things that, look, when you're in the moment and your adrenaline's cranked up and you're with a huge group of people and everybody's doing it, not that that's an excuse, but that's just the reality of the situation. At what point did you think about all the hard work that we put into the Cayenne before dipping the toes in the river. Honestly, it didn't even cross your mind. It didn't, it didn't even come close to crossing my mind. I went in such a different direction. See, Did if I, I was there, it would have been vacuum pump, valve cover gaskets, <laughs> the two back bolts in the corner, specifically <laughs> the air compressor. That would have been crossing my yeah. mind before we dipped the toes. Yeah, I wish those kicked in a little higher before those I Those were the it. signs you needed, not yes. river crossing up ahead. That would have been helpful. So Ben now would have told Ben them, Slow down, dude. Don't ignore the non-signs. <laughs> Don't ignore the moral signs. Yes, exactly. And just listen to your gut. I mean, me and Ethan's gut said, stop, don't do this. Clearly we did. <laughs> so what, you just decided to leave it behind? We honestly didn't have much choice. The reality was that we had to leave the Cayenne behind. You know, the guys from Berg had a shop to run the next morning. It's not like we could just camp out there for the night and work on the car overnight and go get parts. So lucky for us, you know, we had met those Jeep buddies who offered to basically camp overnight with it as they had planned to anyways. Um, they were just gonna watch over the car. And from there, Ethan and I essentially packed up into the two remaining Cayennes and had to head out because we had a lot to figure out. Thank you. Yep. Appreciate you so much. Best I'll say we'll can. consider you paid security. Yeah. We'll keep it on it best we can and have a couple Thanks, for us. Thanks, I appreciate, I appreciate it's it. Big deal. Thank, Thank you guys. Thanks. Take care.
So at this point, you're wet and dirty with a broken kind stuck in the middle of Colorado. Your wife has no idea where you are. Your job has no idea where you are. What's the next move? I plan to get it out. He'll be back, don't worry. We'll get, we'll, we'll get this thing out of there. He won't let it stay here.